evening, everybody. Welcome to our very first program of 2015. Last year, we did 40 programs. 40 programs in 52 weeks. 40 programs in 12 months. It was a rough year, but you know what? We educated many. In fact, during those 40 programs, over 2,400 people attended those programs. So that was a good thing. We felt great about it, and the industry, the pharmaceutical industry, felt great about it. And that's why they like to work with us. That's why they like to give us the grants that we need to do these kinds of programs so we count on them to be at these programs. And so for like tonight even, I want to thank our exhibitors that are here. And we have Accorda Therapeutics, Bayer Healthcare, Biogen IDEC, Genzyme, Pfizer, Novartis, Mallinckrodt, and Teva Neuroscience. Okay, so we want to thank them all for being here tonight and, you know, showing their support for our program and being here to give you guys information. Tonight's program will feature Megan Weigel, okay, and Tina Butterfield. All right, and again, what we're doing here is we're here to educate you all. So we don't want to really take a lot of time tonight. You're going to hear me speak right now. You all don't want to listen, I know that. But listen, in those seminar evaluation forms that I told you about before, we really need you to fill out everything that you liked or disliked about the program. Especially if you did not like listening to me, you could write it down. Am I going to care what you wrote about that? No. But we have to say it anyway, all right? So I want you all to smile. I want you to be happy. I want you to learn from this program. And I want to invite Megan up here right now, and let's get this program started. Thank you. Oh, Stu would like to thank his volunteers as well. Volunteers, thank you everybody. And thank you all for coming out. And I'd like to thank um, Stu and his volunteers and what I'll call the Council of Sponsors because without them we all couldn't be here and we couldn't do things like really awesome things that Stu does, like he videotapes this so people who can't come can watch it online. Um, and. I've known Stu for a long time, like probably since the very beginning of his um, efforts in educating people living with MS. And what he does is really super awesome. And it gives us a chance as healthcare providers to talk to you um, of our own accord. You know, when you come to the pharmaceutical talks, we have to use slides and we can't say certain things. And here it's like a crazy free for all. We can do whatever we want, right? Um, so thank you guys for being here. Tonight we're going to talk about um, symptom management and I'm going to do a little bit about living well with multiple sclerosis and then Tina is going to talk about issues um, related to managing MS in the workplace and some other um, really applicable things to living daily with multiple sclerosis. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Megan Weigel and I'm a nurse practitioner out at the beach. It's a great place to be. Um, and Tina and I used to work together, which was really fun. Um, and she's, she's the reason I ever got into this. So thank you, Tina. <laughs> so let's see if I can figure out how this works. Living well with MS, uh, managing symptoms and living well. So we're gonna talk about the most common symptoms of multiple sclerosis and discuss how we treat them, both with medicines and without medicines. And then we're going to talk about nutrition, exercise, a little bit about spirituality, and then kind of go around and talk about ideas about how you can create a plan that lets you live well with multiple sclerosis. So basic facts that you guys already know. MS affects more than 400,000 people in the US. Women three to four times more likely than men, which is always why there are more women in the room during these dinners. Um, and it's an autoimmune disease. It's a chronic disease. We don't yet know the cause, but we know that it's associated with certain environmental and genetic factors. And some of those factors we're gonna talk about tonight when we talk about living well and how you can actually um, really prevent the risk of your MS um, getting worse faster with diet and certain um, healthy lifestyle changes. Um, so MS is associated with smoking, high sodium intake, low vitamin D, and exposure to the Epstein-Barr virus, which is the virus that causes mono. 
So symptom management overview. We could go around this room and talk to each one of you, and you guys would all have a different day living with multiple sclerosis. Your symptoms may affect your movement. They may affect your sensation, maybe your emotions, or maybe the way that you think. They may be constant. Or they may come and go, like when you're tired or hot or sick, um, and they may get worse over time. Primary symptoms are symptoms that are due directly to a multiple sclerosis lesion. Secondary symptoms are symptoms that are due to a result of having MS. For example, people with MS get more urinary tract infections because their bladders may not work as well. And then tertiary symptoms are kind of the things that happen down the road when you have a chronic illness. For example, you may have to quit your job, or you may end up in relationship struggle, or you may have depression because your role has changed with your family. And so those are things that aren't directly related to MS, but over time, MS may cause those things to come up in your life. Does that make sense? Okay. So the new onset of symptoms may indicate a relapse or a pseudo-relapse, and we're not going to talk about those things today. We're just going to talk about living daily with MS and what happens. So where your symptoms come from is important. So symptoms related to bladder may come from your brain stem or your spinal cord. Symptoms related to your vision, like double vision, or sometimes people say, I feel like my depth perception is off. Those come from your brainstem. When you lose your vision, that comes from your optic nerve. Um, emotional problems, cognitive problems can come from all over your brain, but mainly in the frontal portions and in the gray matter of your brain. And then sensory symptoms and symptoms related to movement can come from anywhere in the brain or spinal cord. So the most common symptoms related to MS plaques are fatigue, cognitive issues, bowel and bladder dysfunction, spasticity, movement problems, visual problems, sensation problems, pain, and depression with or without anxiety. Secondary symptoms, like I mentioned, infection, falls, skin breakdown from sitting in one position for so long, injuries from falling, contractures from spasticity, so maybe your hand gets stuck in a certain way or your foot gets stuck in a certain way, and decreased activities of daily living. And then the tertiary symptoms, things like job loss, loss of intimacy, role changes, family disruption, social isolation, dependency, and loss of self-esteem. And thankfully, I know that Many of you are working on that social isolation thing because you're all here, right? And I know that you attend support groups and you go to group exercise and some of you go to yoga and that's really amazing because it helps prevent a lot of these other symptoms that can happen from multiple sclerosis. So our goals when we manage your symptoms are to eliminate or reduce them and the effect that they have on your life and to improve your quality of life but also to avoid any complications from treating your symptoms. Like, are we gonna give you a medication that's gonna make you feel worse or that's gonna cause another problem? We have to keep that in mind too. And so when I talk to a person about managing their symptoms, I talk to that person about their goals for their symptoms. Are they interested even in taking another medication or do they just wanna talk about rehabilitation options like physical therapy, occupational therapy? So here's kind of the cycle of symptoms and what can happen. And, um, and I, I find this valuable because you can see how it's like a domino effect. So if you're fatigued, if you're depressed, you might decide not to go to exercise class. And if you don't go to exercise class, your spasticity gets worse and you get kind of constipated. And if you get constipated, your bladder function doesn't work as well and you may have some incontinence and that keeps you up at night and then you have trouble thinking. Do you see how all that works? And you can start, we could start anywhere. I could start this way and go this way. I could start here and go like this. But you can see how all of these symptoms can affect one another. And that's why we ask you so many darn ridiculous questions when you come into the office. 
So first, let's talk about fatigue. People with multiple sclerosis describe it as an overwhelming sense of sleepiness, but also not necessarily feeling sleepy, but just feeling like someone pulled the plug out from under you. Um, often I say, like, if you can remember those old, old TVs, you know, that you used to they used to be like this thick instead of this thick. And when they would short out, when the fuse would blow, it would kind of just And a lot of people with MS will say that's kind of what their fatigue feels like. And it's not necessarily related to how well you move or your level of um, movement disability. It can affect the way you think. Um, and it's really not fully understood where this comes from. But we know that there are a lot of causes of fatigue, and we have to make sure that it's not just the MS that's causing it. We have to rule out thyroid disorders, vitamin deficiencies, sleep disturbances, um, and then think about pain and mood, too, when we're talking to you about your fatigue. It is the most common disabling symptom in multiple sclerosis. So it is one of the most common reasons that people will leave the workforce when they have MS, and Unfortunately, it's the hardest thing to prove. So people with MS and fatigue often have a hard time getting social security disability because we can't like, you know, test your muscles and tell you that you're tired, right? We have to rely on your self-reporting of things. It can occur without warning and it may occur very early in the disease and it can worsen other symptoms like your thinking, your depression, and your ability to move. So things that we do to help with fatigue that don't involve medication include cooling equipment. We encourage exercise, and you might say, well, if I'm tired, won't exercise make me worse? But studies have proven that actually exercise does improve fatigue and multiple sclerosis. You just have to do it during your best time of day, and you may have to split up how you exercise. So instead of exercising for 30 minutes at a time, you may, may do 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes later in the afternoon. Occupational therapy and physical therapy can help with co energy conservation techniques, like how can you do, um, how can you get your dinner together conserving energy instead of bouncing around the kitchen like a ping pong ball, you sit and you think about what you need from which places, and you gather things and you sit down and you cook dinner. And that can save, when you think about it, maybe 40 steps, which could conserve energy. Um, and then encouraging exercise and relaxation and really encouraging rest is important and also managing your good days well. So how many of you have good days and you do like 50 things and then you're like, why am I in bed for the next two days? Why can't I get off the couch, right? So you have to learn how to manage your good days well so that you're not in bed for the next two days. So we use medicines to treat fatigue too, and the ones that we like to use the best are medicines called ProVigil and NuVigil. And unfortunately, they are not FDA approved to treat fatigue related to multiple sclerosis, and we oftentimes can't get them approved through your insurance companies, even with second and third level appeals. Um, I have heard that they are most affordable without, a, uh, without your insurance at Costco. That's what I'm told. Um, amantadine is something that we also use. We use activating antidepressants like Prozac, uh, Welbutrin. We use amphetamines like Adderall and Ritalin. Um, and then caffeine products, coffee, green tea, um, and there was a, a recent really small study that showed that using ginkgo biloba, um, 240 milligrams a day for at least four weeks may improve fatigue a little bit. Doesn't work for memory, but it may improve fatigue a little bit. So let's talk about spasticity. Do you guys know what spasticity is? Yeah? Yeah, and some of you that have it didn't know it was spasticity until like we put a name on it, right? So it's that like tight, pull, heavy, I feel like I have a blood pressure cuff around my arm or my chest or my leg. Um, and it results in an increased resistance to stretch. So if someone pulls your leg, your leg get stuck. It won't straighten all the way out and it may shake a little bit. Um, your reflexes will be increased, which is why for those of you that I know from my office, I 
I put my hand in front of your leg when I check your reflexes so you don't bop me in the face, because your reflexes may be increased. Um, it limits mobility, it increases energy expenditure, and it causes pain. So spasticity is a big deal. And we start generally with um, non-medicinal non interventions. So things like bracing, movement, stretching. And then we can move on to medicines that you take by mouth. And then um, medicines that you can inject. And then lastly, surgical interventions like the baclofen pump. So we talked about stretching, positioning. For those of you that spend most of your time in wheelchairs or scooters, there are certain seating techniques that can help. Range of motion exercises are incredibly important, whether you're doing them by yourself with a care partner or with a physical therapist. And then pharmacologic, uh, so medicines, includes things like baclofen, tizanidine, gabapentin, um, Kepra sometimes, Valium or Diazepam, and then we use Botox for certain types of spasticity, particularly in the arm and in the leg. And then the baclofen pump is our surgical intervention. And the baclofen pump has come a long way over time. It's quite small. It infuses baclofen continuously during the day. And it can do so at higher doses so that you are getting a better effect than what you would take by mouth without the, the uh, central nervous system effects of sleepiness. So bladder, bowel, and sexual dysfunction, we have, we're not eating yet, are we? Let's move through this before they serve dinner. I'm OK with talking about this stuff all day long, but I know some people aren't. So bladder dysfunction can be divided into three different things. One is the inability to store. One is the inability to empty. And then the most common one that we see is a combination of these things. And for you guys, you might say, you know what, I'm really good this month. I'm fine. Like, I haven't had any issues getting to the bathroom on time or any issues with dribbling. And then two weeks later, you're calling and you're saying, I can't empty my bladder all the way. Um, and you don't have a urinary tract infection. It's just that your MS is doing different things. So symptoms of the inability to store are things like going to the bathroom a lot, having incontinence, urinating at night. Um, and then if you have something called a post-void residual, um, where they look at your bladder after you urinate, to see if anything's left inside, there's, there's nothing there, because it's come out, just maybe not when you wanted it to, right? So inability to empty, you have urgency, hesitancy, you go to the bathroom, you get up and walk away, and you're like, oh my god, I just, I, I don't feel like I'm done. And you have to go back. Um, you have frequency, and when they check your bladder after you urinate, you have urine left in your bladder. And then a combination of these things is really, like I said, what happens to most of you, and it's the most annoying, because you may find that sometimes your medicine for your bladder works, and sometimes it makes things worse. And I hear that a lot in my office. And that's why we en enlist the help of urologists a lot with these types of symptoms. So treatment goals really are to re re uh, retain your renal function, because that's really important. A bladder infection doesn't always mean a kidney infection. We don't want it to go up that high. To establish normal voiding patterns and to reduce symptoms that impact your quality of life, such as, I'm not going out tonight because I'm afraid I'm going to pee. Right? I'm afraid I'm going to have an accident when I go to that dinner, so I'm going to stay at home. And I know that that's really common. So non-pharmacological things that we can do are bladder training, behavior and diet modification, particularly limiting or eliminating caffeine, alcohol, and artificial sweeteners. Those are all bladder irritants. Um, and then the, the last step in that realm would be um, intermittent catheterization. So you can actually learn how to catheterize yourself so that you empty your bladder of urine before you go out or before you run errands. And that can be very helpful for some people. Pharmacologic treatments are huge. There are so many medications now to treat bladder dysfunction. The old ones have more side effects than the new ones. And then uh, prevention of secondary symptoms like urinary tract infections. If you hold on to your urine, if you say, I'm going to hold it, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go, that increases your risk for urinary tract infection. So we tell people to drink larger amounts of fluids at regular times during the day. So if you sip, 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 you drip, drip, drip. 
So maybe you drink a large glass of water in the morning, you know, several times throughout the day, maybe four or five times throughout the day, you drink a large glass of water so that you're actually urinating at appropriate intervals. And maybe you do scheduled voiding. So every two hours, you just go and you sit on the toilet to see if you have to urinate. And then dietary, um, dietary things, like I mentioned, and that also includes um, acidy foods, citrusy foods, can also irritate the bladder. Now, bowel symptoms in MS typically are just constipation. That's the most common one. And what happens is that when you have bladder issues, like incontinence and frequency, you say, well, I'm not going to drink any water because then I won't have to pee. And then you get constipated. And then your full bowel presses on your bladder. And then you have incontinence. So just drink some water, folks. It's going to make everything better. It's also going to improve your energy level. Bowel incontinence is uncommon, but can happen when you lose control of your bowel sphincter um, or if your, your bowel becomes hyperreflexic. And if you're having issues with bowel incontinence, it's really important to talk to your healthcare provider about this. The worst thing that you can do is start using enemas and start using things like Dolcolax all the time, you, your body actually becomes dependent on those and you can shoot yourself in the foot by using those things. So if you're having bladder issues, please talk to your healthcare provider about that. So constipation, fluids, 64 ounces of water a day, um, if you can, try. Um, and if you don't like water, try getting one of those jugs that have, there's jugs that have like little um, a pillar in the middle where you can put fruit, you can put cucumbers, kind of like at the spa, and the flavors diffuse into the water, makes it a little bit more pal palatable. Depending on what's happening, we may recommend fiber, but we may not, because if you're not drinking enough water and you, dr and you eat too much fiber, we're gonna do you more harm than good. There are definitely prescription medications that can help um, with constipation, and then stool softeners can also be helpful. But this management of constipation is really dependent on your lifestyle and your diet, and so it's important, like I said, to talk to your healthcare provider about this stuff. Sexual dysfunction happens in about half of women with MS and three quarters of men, and it can have a significant impact on quality of life, and it's often overlooked, A, because you don't want to talk about it, B, because we don't want to talk about it, but guess what? It's life. It's how we all got here. So it can't, it can't really be that embarrassing, and it's important. It, difficulties include decreased sex drive, period. Like, I don't want to do it. And it can, that can be because of MS. It can because of your, be because of your medications. It can be because of pain. It can be because of where your lesions are. It can be because you're embarrassed that you might tinkle. It can, be, it can go on and on and on and on. Erectile dysfunction, problems with ejaculation can occur. Altered genital sensation can make things uncomfortable or just like you can't feel things, period. Decreased frequency or intensity of orgasms, decreased lubrication, bladder spasticity, and all of these things can worsen depression. So you can see that it's really important to talk about this. And management, first of all, we have to exclude other causes. It's particularly in men, diabetes can cause problems with erection and so can high blood pressure. And then we use um, pharmacological treatments, like the, I call it the bathtub commercial, what is it, Cialis, where they're in the backyard in their bathtub. So medicines like Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, we can use those for men. We can also try them for women. We can use certain antidepressants to increase your sex drive. We can time timing of medications to try to help you with pain and spasticity so that things aren't as painful. Um, and then there are also a lot of things that you can buy to help with sexual dysfunction, like, um, oh, what am I going to call them? Like um, triangle pillows so that you can keep your legs up and you don't have to worry about muscle spasm. There are all kinds of um, different vibrators and different toys that you can use to help increase sensation. I'll tell you guys a funny story since I've already ruined myself on video. I went to, um, I went to Pensacola to do a talk on sexual dysfunction to people with multiple sclerosis years ago. And it was before, um, I, 
No, it was after 9-11, a little bit after 9-11. And I had, I was just going for the day, right? So I had a bag with nothing in it but books about sexual dysfunction and toys and samples. <laughs> and so I go through security and I was like, I didn't even think about it. I just threw the bag up there and then I was like, oh my God. And I'm not even going with like a bag. Like I'm going and I'm coming back. Who is this girl, right? Well, I think they were so mortified by what was in the bag that they just let me go through. They just totally let me go through. Um, so this is a, you know, this is a, a talk that you can have over a whole day, but there are plenty of things that you can do to enjoy sex when you have multiple sclerosis, no matter what's happening to your body. Um, and MS nurses are really good people to talk to about these things. Key to successful management, obviously, is open communication. You have to be willing to talk about these things. Um, and then just really being sensitive. You know, we might ask you about um, sex and assume you're having it, and maybe you don't want to, and that's fine. So we just have to be real careful with one another. So let's talk a little bit about pain. Pain, next to fatigue, I find, is probably the hardest thing to treat um, in multiple sclerosis. It's really complex. And many of you will say, well, is my pain related to MS or is it related to something else? And my answer is usually that because you have MS, your response to pain is a little bit different. So your back pain from arthritis might feel different than someone who has back pain who doesn't have multiple sclerosis because you're not throwing in with that person the spasticity and the altered sensation that already exists. It's a really common cause of disability in people with MS and it's under-recognized and usually not managed well. So acute painful syndromes can happen from a relapse like a Lermite sign, which is when you tip your chin down to your chest and you get that shock down your spine, that can happen from a new MS lesion or it can be a, common, a chronic problem. Optic neuritis can be painful and that's an acute symptom or something that's happening like all of a sudden. Um, and then neuralgic pain, like trigeminal neuralgia. I don't know how many of you in this room have ever experienced that, but it's a horrible shock-like facial pain that comes and goes. Chronic syndromes are things that are that they're with you all the time. They're your numbness, burning, tingling sensations, your musculoskeletal pains like back pain, neck pain, hip pain, um, and then spasticity. So I'll try to, I wanted to put this up here because I think it might make some of you feel a little bit better about pain. In blue, we have people with MS, and in orange, we have people without MS. And you can see that people with MS, for the most part, will have pain in their extremities, but not necessarily muscle or joint pain. They also have a lot of joint pain, a lot of back and head pain. Uh, muscle pain, neck pain, eye pain, belly pain, chest pain, face pain. So you can see that it doesn't just have to be localized to a place that's affected by your MS. So what can we do for you without medicine? Well, we can talk about stress, stress and relaxation techniques, um, complementary and alternative medicine like acupuncture, massage, um, Reiki therapy. Uh, counseling, cooling techniques often help with pain, and so can physical and occupational therapy, particularly if the pain is arthritic in nature or, um, or musculoskeletal. For medicine management, we really initially, except for acute pain, like to steer away from narcotics and from chronic narcotic use because Chronic narcotic use can cause constipation and urinary retention and um, something called a kindling phenomenon, uh, which means it can actually make your pain worse over time. So we use things like anti-seizure medicines, carbamazepine, uh, gabapentin or neurontin, Lyrica, you guys have probably heard these words, and also antidepressants like amitriptyline, uh, nortriptyline, and Cymbalta. And then these days, there are a lot of topical ways to treat pain. Patches like the Flector patch, the Lidoderm patch, and creams that are made up of like 10 different medications that you rub on the painful area. 
Um, and those work for some people. I'd say probably about 70% of the people that I try those pain creams for in my practice, um, they, they're helpful. And then moving on to depression, high rates of depression in multiple sclerosis. So about 50% of people have major depression. And this can lead to decreases in quality of life, loss of self-esteem, and there's an increased incidence of suicide in people with MS who have depression. And it's really, um, it's really important that we as healthcare providers talk to you about this, and that if you're worried that something you're experiencing may be a sign of depression, that you talk to us about it. And depression doesn't always mean you have to feel sad or be crying all the time. So there are other symptoms of depression, like being irritable, feeling like your energy is low, losing interest in things that usually make you happy, having significant changes in your appetite, like you lose your appetite, or maybe you're craving sweets all the time, or maybe you lose weight or gain weight. Changes in your sleep behavior, like waking up at 3 and 4 in the morning when you used to be able to sleep through the night. Being unable to fall asleep because your mind is going, because you're worrying. Um, a decreased sex drive. Um, and then also suicidal thoughts, but not even suicidal thoughts, but morbid thoughts. Just thinking about death a lot. Like, what's going to happen to my family when I die? What's going to happen to my family if I have a bad relapse? It, it, or if you lose a person close to you, you might constantly be wondering about or worrying or being sad about the death of that person, which is normal for a period of time. It's the most common mood disorder in people with MS. It can occur for many reasons. It can occur because of uh, where your lesions are in your brain and how many you have. Medications can cause depression. And it can also occur just because you have a chronic, unpredictable illness that affects your quality of life, right? And so that could be a person living with MS or a person living with diabetes that's difficult to manage. There's a weak association between depression and some of the disease-modifying therapies, like interferon therapies. And I, I personally, um, even though we're required to talk about that when we talk about side effects of interferon therapies, I think that um, we can manage depression for the most part in people on interferons and keep them on them safely. So how do we treat depression? Well, most people want a magic pill, right? They want a magic pill to make them feel better and make everything go away. Um, the problem is that magic pills work best when they're combined with psychotherapy. So behavioral therapy, counseling, and medicine work better together. Um, and the reason is you can take a magic pill for depression and you can feel better, but if you never learned how to deal with the things that are gonna keep coming up, you're never gonna learn how to deal with them. And eventually the magic pill gets useless. So you've gotta face the demons, you've gotta work with a counselor. Cognitive dysfunction, I think many people complain about that. It's really annoying. Um, and it's really, um, gosh, it's just, it's hard to treat in MS. The medicines that we use to treat Alzheimer's disease don't work to treat memory and multiple sclerosis. And again, it can be caused by a lot of things, like your MS, or the amount of medicine that you take, or the lack of sleep that you're getting, or your pain. So we have to address all of these things when we're talking about cognition. It can occur like fatigue early in the disease, doesn't correlate with how you walk. You can be walking just fine and still have issues with memory. And it may be real subtle. These are the things that are impaired by um, cognitive dysfunction in MS, memory, information processing speed, problem solving, visuospatial function, attention, concentration, and then um, I see least, least often verbal issues like difficulty with word finding. So we usually do neuropsychometric testing to really hone in on the nitty gritty of how your memory or your cognition is affected by MS. This also helps us support whether or not um, you can stay in the workplace and some legal cases. And it, it helps us to determine whether or not your cognitive issues are related to MS or to other things like depression or pain. And then we can start to work on them the right way. Usually, 
we do cognitive rehab, we may recommend counseling, and we, we may recommend just kind of easy strategies to remember things, like writing things down, using alarms, using caregivers or care partners to help you remember how to do things. And then always keeping in mind that for relapsing forms of MS, using disease-modifying therapy slows down disease progression, which hopefully will preserve your cognition over time. So I'm going to skip some of these um, less common things and get on to the second part of the talk because I'm getting the hands up sign here. So health is um, more than freedom from disease. It's more than freedom from illness. And it's more than freedom from debil debilitating conditions. You can live a healthy life with good well-being when you're living with a chronic illness if you treat yourself well and if you do the things that you need to do to keep yourself healthy and well. So wellness is multidimensional. It's not just your body. It's not just your physical health. It's your emotional health, your spiritual health, your intellectual health your social health, and your physical body. This is the health and wellness circle of MS. So are we managing your symptoms well? Are we modifying your disease the best we can? Are we providing you with a support system? Do you have a primary care doctor that's managing your other medical needs? Are you following a good nutrition plan? Are you educating yourself and advocating for yourself by being at programs like this? These are all things that can help you live a better life with MS. Diet's a big topic. If you Google diet and MS, you're going to come up with more than 2 million hits. So how do you guys make sense of all of this? To me, the bottom line is unless you're truly allergic to something or you have a medical condition that mandates it, it's not, I don't recommend elimination of food groups to people. The most popular diets in MS are the Swank diet, the Gold Coast Cure, and the Walls diet, which is a type of paleo diet. What you'll find in all of these diets is that they're low in fat, they're very high in vegetable intake, particularly green vegetable intake, they're high in omega-3 fatty acids, and they steer you away from sugars, white flours, white rices, white breads, and processed foods. So that's the bottom line for me. Anecdotally, when you start following a healthier diet, you feel better. There is not a lot of research in MS that proves that any of these diets will work to modify your disease, but we do know that your symptoms will improve and your overall health will improve. So good rules to follow, make your diet bright in color, low in fat, whole grains, lots of fluids, avoid sugar, salt, and alcohol, and processed, processed foods. You can do this by walking the perimeter of the grocery store. You just shop on the outside. If you're an animal protein eater, make sure that your animal protein comes from good sources, like hormone and antibiotic-free, grass-fed, free-range beef. Um, same thing with eggs and poultry. Um, and there's a really great application um, for the cell phones on where to uh, how to find safe uh, seafood, and it's called um, the Seafood Guide. It's put on by the Seattle Aquarium. I believe it's free. I use it. It's a really nice um, app. So here are just some hints. A serving of what? So one orange, OK. A serving of strawberries, eight strawberries. A serving of grapes is a cup. There's a banana. A serving of blueberries is a cup, and then there's a pear. This is going to become interesting when we get to nuts. Um, and this will all be available online um, on, on the talk that's being recorded, so don't feel like you need to write this stuff down quickly. Here are some options for quick five-minute dinners. If you're in a hurry, conserving energy. Egg, spinach, beans. Make something with that. Um, fish, carrots, green beans. Um, lettuce, avocado, grilled chicken. Really easy things to do. Paleo. Everyone's into the paleo diet these days. I am not a meat eater, um, but I feel that it's important to know about this because everyone's into it. So what is paleo on the left-hand side? What is not? Dairy, grains, corn, white potatoes, beans are not paleo. So on that um, Terry Walls diet, she very much limits the, the amount and the type of beans or legumes that you can eat per week. 
No refined sugar, no refined oils, no processed foods, no alcohol. So here's a great little recipe for building a salad dressing. So much healthier for you than buying things from the bottle. A little oil and a little vinegar goes a long way without all of the chemicals that go into to making um, salad dressings. This is the ultimate grocery list for one, double it for two people. Again, it's, it, this will be on Stu's website. And here's portion sizes. So your fingertip is a teaspoon. Your thumb, a tablespoon. The palm of your hand is a serving size for meat, chicken, poultry, fish, right? You go to Carabas, you get four times that. How many times a week are you doing that? Your fist is, um, is a serving of pasta. Your fist. Uh-oh. Yeah, uh-oh. So that's really helpful. Um, these are the names for sugar, 56 different names for sugar. Yeah. So when you buy a processed food, try to keep it five ingredients or less and make sure you can pronounce them all. Nuts. How many of you like nuts? Okay, my dad loves nuts. He's like, nuts are healthy for me. And then the whole tin of cashews is gone and the man's had 1,000 grams of fat. And I'm like, dad, okay, we gotta talk about portion sizes. So eight walnuts is a portion size, 10 macadamia nuts, 22 cashews, 10 peanuts, 29 almonds, 62 pistachios. Those are all 200 calorie portion sizes of nuts. Watching a football game, oh my God, you can easily eat 100 peanuts, right? I'm sure. Um, science says that romaine beets kale, actually, these are top green vegetables. Watercress is the most nutrient rich. And then these are healthy ways to get your vitamins in food. I'm going to back up and talk about these diets a little bit more in detail. So the swank diet, who's heard of the swank diet? Okay, swank diet is the oldest diet for MS. I think, I think it started in the 50s. Bans all dairy, all gluten, all beans, all saturated fats. High intake of unsaturated fats from fish and fish oils. Um, it's extreme in its original form, but its modified form is easier to adapt to. And you can find the Swank Diet online. You can Google it. Um, I recommend a lot the book called The Gold Coast Cure. This is predominantly a low-fat, gluten-free diet, high in omega-3s, lots of vegetables, no processed foods, a little bit easier to follow than the Swank diet. And I encourage people to make these work into their daily life. You don't have to follow them like super closely. Yes, Stu? Okay. Um, the Terry Walls diet, um, or partially or type of the paleo diet, General rules are nine cups of vegetables per day, three cups of greens, three sulfur, cups of sulfur-rich vegetables, which are things like cauliflower, mushrooms, asparagus, three cups of bright-colored veggies, wild fish, grass-fed meat, organ meat, and sea vegetables. And she feels that the combination of these things gets the right amount of B vitamins, CoQ10, um, and um, good for you fats into your body to allow your nervous system to work appropriately. She's actually doing a study right now um, looking at how this diet can affect symptoms in multiple sclerosis, which is really cool. Yes? Five. Okay, thank you. Gosh, I'm totally out of it. All right, so let's go back to the ultimate healthy grocery list for one. I can take this off, right? Okay, I'm going to move over here because I can't see it, which means I know you guys can't. So produce, a quart of berries, four bananas, a melon, four uh, pears, oranges, apples, two lemons, two limes, bunch of broccoli, bunch of kale, lots of green vegetables. You don't have to have this with you all the time, but these are things that you can choose from. Two avocados, proteins, uh, six to eight ounces of boneless, skinless chicken breast, six to eight ounces of seafood or lean beef, 
grains like whole grain bread, whole grain pasta, brown rice. And whole grain bread, like our, our whole wheat bread is so processed that it's not even whole wheat bread. So a whole grain bread is something like a sprouted grain bread, like Ezekiel bread that you buy in the freezer section. Um, light whole wheat Wonder Bread, like you might as well just buy white Wonder Bread. It's so processed and so full of sugar that it really is just as bad for you as eating the real thing. So I really encourage people to look at whole grains and really, like, can you see them in the bread? And if you can, that's a good thing. Dairy and eggs, a dozen eggs, a half gallon of milk, um, feta cheese, low-fat cottage cheese, Canned goods you have to be really careful of because of sodium. And snacks, nuts, dried fruit, um, vegetables, cut up vegetables. And then pantry staples would be low sodium sauces and spices. And I'm going to move on to sodium. So. I hope you're all taking vitamin D3 in this room. We know a lot about vitamin D3. Sodium is something that's big in MS News these days. We now have a lot of data to tell us that people that follow a high sodium diet have a greater likelihood of getting MS and have worse MS. High sodium intake is, is you're four, almost four times more likely to have a relapse. Medium sodium intake, almost three times more likely. High sodium intake, three and a half times more likely to get a, a new brain lesion. High sodium was defined as four grams of sodium per day. If you eat a can of Campbell's chicken soup per day, that's 1,200 grams of sodium. That doesn't include the salt you put on your food, the salt that was in your ketchup that you put on your sandwich. You see where I'm going? It's really easy to get four grams of sodium per day. You should have no more than two grams of sodium per day. Following a healthy diet helps you prevent overweight and obesity. And these are things that we know are associated with other medical conditions. Diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, sleep apnea, um, high cholesterol, stroke. Um, things that really make your MS worse because then you're just adding another load of disease onto a chronic illness that you can have be a manageable chronic illness. And then if you're a smoker, you've got to quit. There's just no other answer. You have to quit smoking. Exercise is associated with decreased weakness, fatigue, better mood, better bowel and bladder function. So basically, play every day. It doesn't have to be um, something strenuous. It might be a little bit of movement or a little bit of stretching. It might be that you attend some yoga a few times a week and maybe on the days that you don't go to yoga or to Brooks, you're just, maybe you, maybe you dance in your house for 10 minutes. You find out what works for you. You exercise during your best time of day. You stay cool. And if you don't know what to do, ask your um, healthcare provider for a physical therapy um, evaluation to help you. And then that's it. All right. So, so, so what we're going to do now, before we have Tina, we're going to do Q&A. Oh, OK. All right, we're going to do Q&A first for about 30 minutes, and then we're going to have Tina come up. Now, everybody, the holidays were really bad to me, all right? They put some pounds on. I need to be run around this room with questions. So let's start somewhere. And who's ready to do question? Great. Oh, let me start here, and then I'll get there, right? I can't run that hard. Hi, my question is real simple. Um, I think you said that the information you provided to us is in Stu's website, right? Well, the video will the, be the video. on the website. Okay, and then where can we find the, those tips? So you can find those tips if you watch the video on the website because you don't have a pen right now. These um, pictures that I posted are from a website called, it's real, I mean, it's long, but this is the website. Okay. And so if you watch the video, you can probably write that down, but we'll leave that up. So everybody knows, you can go to our website and from there you could click on the YouTube channel. All right, and if you don't want to go to the website first, you just go to youtube.com 
backslash MS Views and News. All right, and not just this program, but all the ones that we've recorded over the last few years are on there. So you don't have to actually sit here and take notes. Just watch the program again. And you could stop and start whenever you have to use the bathroom. Okay? <laughs> just take it easy. I have two questions. I have two questions. What is sea vegetables? Okay. And is a uh, squid and conch good for you? Okay, so sea vegetables are things like kelp. Dul dulce is a sea vegetable. Um, oh my goodness, I'm forgetting the clear, there's like a clear noodle. Do you remember the name of it, Tina? Soba? Soba, soba well no, soba noodles are, are they made from sea vegetables? No, they're not made from sea vegetables. But kelp and dulce and, um, and seaweed itself. So if you go to the, um, a specialty food store like Native Sun or Whole Foods, um, or even some of the newer grocery stores that are popping up in the Asian section, they will sell bags of dried sea vegetables and you can sprinkle them in salads. Yeah. And then squid, um, are those things good for you? Well, they're not sea vegetables. Um, they're not, they're, they're not bad for you. They're not high in omega-3s like other fishes are, but they're, yeah, they're good for you. As long as it's not fried calamari every night. Yeah. Yes. Romaine is better than kale? Apparently so. That's what this, um, that's what this is saying, and I'll tell you why. It's, first of all, it's full of water. So this is a density score of the nutritional content. Now, we're looking at like a total nutritional content. So kale in and of itself might have more of a certain type of nutrient, but romaine scores a higher nutrient dense um, score than kale did. So for things like fiber, protein, potassium, vitamins, and minerals. Yeah, and watercress is the best. Megan, I have two questions. Yes. What about taking a multivitamin every day and mm -hmm. also probiotics? So what are the questions? Is it good to? Is it good for people with MS to take a multivitamin well, and probiotics? Well, it's much better to get your vitamins from food. Your body likes food better. Um, but a lot of people have aversions to certain foods. So if your diet is the same every day and it's bland and it's not colorful and it's not healthy, then by all means you should take a multivitamin. It would be much better for you to start eating a healthy diet and varying your diet. Um, probiotics can be good for people if you're having certain bowel issues, um, but not everyone has to take a probiotic. Any other questions? Wow, must have known everything. Here you go. Where do you get those, those cooling vests? Where do you get the cooling vests? A lot of places. Actually, out on the table out front where Jill is sitting, there's a pamphlet for polar products, which is a really great place to get cooling vests. You can also Google cooling supplies, and you can come up with some nice websites. I've found that websites for construction workers often have cheaper cooling garments than websites for people with multiple sclerosis. There is also a cooling um, grant program through the MS Foundation. You can apply to get a set of cooling equipment if you meet certain income requirements. Jody. I just wanted to offer also with regard to cooling, there's a product out there called uh, Frog Togs yes. Chili Towel or Chili Pad. And it's basically a very, it's a dish towel sized, very thin sponge. And it's wonderful. It works, it worked for me. It was a lifesaver. I keep it with me all summer long. And um, it's cheaper at Walmart than it is at Dick's Sporting Goods. Yeah, you can get those everywhere. Not necessarily under the name Frog Togs. But um, on the Frog Togs website, you can also buy... Um, not just the towels, but other, other types of cooling garments, or chili towels, I should say, other types of chili towels, like baseball hats that are chili towels. Um, wondering how much vitamin D3 per day? 
So but your, the amount of vitamin D3 you should take per day really depends on your level. So ask your healthcare provider to check a vitamin D level. In multiple sclerosis, we like your vitamin D level to be over 50, but that's not how it should be for everyone who doesn't have multiple sclerosis. So ask to have your level checked, and then you can have, um, uh, have a recommendation made based on what your level is. Anybody else? Okay, we want to thank Megan for being Thanks, here today. Thanks, guys. You guys are awesome. Thanks for your questions. Thank you again. You're welcome. We look, she's going to be with us in Ocala, so if anybody wants to come to Ocala, we're doing that in February, right? I, that's what you told that's me. That's right. February 11th. Come I on down. I do what down. Stu tells me.